let's summarize some of the most read and critically acclaimed poems of Robert Frost. In the pasture, a speaker intends to do some chores in the pasture, repeating to readers, I shan't be gone long, you come too. In mowing, a mower's thought processes have taken him from fantasies of idleness to the riches inherent in work. In the tuft of flowers, a farmhand turning grass in a field imagines the work of a solitary mower. His meditation is interrupted as he follows a butterfly's circling flight that leads to a tuft of bright flowers. In Mending Wall, two neighbors meet on either side of their property wall to repair gaps. The speaker doesn't think they need the wall, but the neighbor insists on upholding tradition, stating, good fences make good neighbors. In The Death of the Hired Man, a couple's inconsistent hired man, Silas, has returned in terrible shape and needing help. The husband is unsympathetic, but his wife convinces him to take pity on Silas. Warren checks in on the sleeping man and finds he's dead. In Home Burial, a grieving man and woman argue about the death of their child. The man recognizes that his wife has not recovered from the death and that his mourning is not like hers. In After Apple Picking, an apple picker recalls the sight of distorted apples through a pane of ice skimmed from the water trough that morning, wondering if his exhaustion is like the sleep of hibernation or just some human sleep. The woodpile is about a speaker walking and encountering a cord of wood long ago abandoned, the logs left to warm the frozen swamp as best they could, which is to say, not at all. In the road not taken, a traveler comes upon two divergent roads and laments that he cannot travel both. He imagines that in the future, he will announce with a sigh that he chose the road less traveled by, and that made all the difference. In Hyla Brook, a speaker remembers a brook for what it no longer is. What's left is a bed lined with dry, dead leaves, the only element of substance in a song made of memory and love. In Birches, a speaker sees birch trees arching in the woods and likes to think some boy has been swinging them. He would like to once again be a youthful swinger of birches. In Fire and Ice, a speaker considers apocalyptic scenarios, speculating on whether the world will come to an end by fire or ice. In Dust of Snow, a speaker is dusted with snow a crow had shaken from a hemlock tree. The small gesture improves his mood. In Nothing Gold Can Stay, from shoots and leaves of plants to the Garden of Eden, gold in nature offers a fleeting glimpse of immortality. In The Runaway, two people stop at a mountain pasture and see a frightened colt. One observes that whoever has left the colt out ought to be told to come and take him in. In Stopping by Woods on a Snowy Evening, a speaker stops in the woods to watch the snow fall on the darkest night of the year, admiring the peaceful solitude. In Acquainted with the Night, the speaker walks alone at night, and the passage of time seemingly counts for nothing in his life. In Two Tramps in Mud Time, a speaker is chopping wood when two men come along looking for work. He recognizes a crucial life lesson. In his solitude, he has melded vocation with avocation. In neither out far nor in deep, people stand on a beach and look out to sea all day, even though they can't see very far or deep. In The Gift Outright, the speaker observes that we were not American even as the land was ours. Only through generations of service has the patriot gained opportunities to enhance the land with stories and art. In Take Something Like a Star, the speaker looks to a star for help, determining that when speech is corrupted, meaning and purpose may be maintained if we take our models from the star, standing tall and remaining fixed in position. Just because Robert Frost wrote poems and not fiction doesn't mean his work isn't full of characters. Six of them are key to a number of his poems. First is Silas. Silas's character comes through the dialogue between Mary and her husband Warren in the poem The Death of the Hired Man, whose home Silas has chosen to return to in his final sickness. And at the end of the poem, Warren confirms that Silas has died. Mary, talking on the porch with Warren, is depicted as an angel of mercy, bathed in moonlight, her hand held out among the harp-like morning glory strings. Her tenderness is evident when she helps Warren understand what home means, something you somehow haven't to deserve. Her conviction stirs Warren's sympathies. Warren is Mary's husband, and after listing his complaints to his wife, he's swayed by her kindness towards Silas and her understanding. Her gentleness enables him to redefine home through new understanding. Home is the place where, when you have to go there, they have to take you in. He has learned something and prepares to visit with Silas. He is, however, 
too late. Silas is dead. The mourning husband in home burial is a bereaved father who warily watches his wife and tries to engage her in conversation about her sorrow. Wishing he were more understanding, even more feminine, and thus more likely to be heard by her, he finally gives up in disappointment and anger. The mourning wife in home burial is a young mother who has lost her only child and is overcome by anger and grief. Immersed in the terrible loneliness of her grief, she cannot, and perhaps does not want, to be reached out to by her husband. She's angry and wants to escape. The woodchopper in Two Tramps in Mud Time is enjoying his skill at his task of chopping wood. Basking in the changing weather, his self-congratulatory mood is interrupted when he sees two tramps coming out of the woods, and he assumes they need work and would like to be paid for the job he's doing for free, and with such pleasure. He puts his guilt aside and chooses his own needs, continuing to chop his wood, rationalizing that he is achieving a life objective, unifying his vocation and his avocation. The key physical symbols in Frost's poetry are things connected to nature. Rocks, flowers, and stacked firewood. In Mending Wall, the rocks, while recalling the landscape for locals, are all about the stony nature of two men set in their ways. The rocks are at one moment a joke, and at another, a building material designed to close gaps. They represent the petrified convictions of two points of view. The poem shows distance that can't be closed between one man who believes himself to be modern and his stubbornly old-fashioned neighbor. Flowers are another major symbol. In The Tuft of Flowers, the resting flower of yesterday's delight, a withered flower, and a leaping tongue of bloom, a tuft of flowers, become emblems of the dead and the living. It is difficult to read this poem and not think of Frost's many losses. As the field hand clears the field, so too it would seem that his head clears. The two sorts of flowers coalesce in sheer morning gladness. They represent a mourner's recovery from loss and grief and a re-entry into a world of human sensation and connection. The relief from mourning is generated in this poem through the narrative and the language that moves us from images of silence and drought to bird songs and blooms. Stacked firewood is a final crucial symbol. In the poem The Woodpile, stacked maple logs bound in clematis vines hold a mystery. Line by line, the reader discovers the change of mood as the speaker worries about getting lost in the woods, takes heart as he follows a little bird, and finally is engaged in speculation about the woodpile. A stack of dead wood becomes a vivid artifact, a record of a lost time and lost skills, a bringing together of past and present in a simple image. The woodpile is not a fixed symbol, but an image that represents a variety of feelings in an instant in time. For Robert Frost, key themes like ambivalence and isolation and mortality are currents beneath his poetry that breach the surface of his language through sustained metaphors, structure of language and rhyme, and enduring turns of phrase. As often as a speaker takes a stand or chooses a position in Frost's poetry, the opposing ambivalence or uncertainty is present around every corner. Sometimes it's in the consciousness of one man, as in the pasture, where solitude and the company of a beloved have nearly equal appeal. It may also exist as distinct perceptions between two individuals, such as in Mending Wall and the death of the hired man. Ambivalence can also be found in Fire and Ice, which shows that two seeming opposites, fiery desire and icy hatred, are equally destructive. In Frost's poems, ambivalence serves as a reminder that opposing views may be simultaneously correct. It is the nature of language and culture to assume that opposing terms demand a choice. Frost's work is full of reminders about the simultaneous validity of opposing ideas. Isolation and mortality is another critical theme in Frost's poetry. His diction, or word choice, ranges often at loss and tragedy. But equally evident are his searches for ways to overcome heart-wrenching events and find recovery in peace and hope. 
In home burial, anger characterizes the relationship between husband and wife. Beyond the bitter tone of the piece is the inescapable situational irony of marriage and parenthood, relationships that have led not to companionship, but to isolation. This couple cannot share what should be the common pain in burying their firstborn child. After Apple Picking is a poem that exemplifies the resignation and graceful acceptance of a life without material success. This song of grace and acceptance is an appreciation of mortality as a well-earned rest. Nothing gold can stay, Frost's hymn to mortality is charged with a profoundly sweet human sadness, like a song that might have been sung by the biblical Adam and Eve at the moment of expulsion from the Garden of Eden, a song all mortals sing. For all the perfection of gold, its fleeting beauty is a reminder that immortality is not possible, 